Hey folks, Matthew Weiss here, WeissAdvice.com. This video is going to be on how to set levels, and right off the bat, you might be thinking, what? Why do we need to make a tutorial on how to set levels? You just turn things to where they sound right, and boom, you're done. And on a certain level, that's correct. Pun intended? I don't know. Uh, but really, when it comes to levels, the levels, the balances of your different elements are your mix. The success of your mix is essentially the success of your balances. And I know that that sounds a little weird. We're used to all these dazzly effects being like the quintessential things that you need to make a mix great. Saturation, distortion, reverb, compression. Yes, those are all really important things, but a mix by definition is the relationship between one element and all the other elements in a record. So how everything is relating to everything else, that is the mix. And if you get the balance right, the communication between the elements becomes very exciting, becomes emotionally rich, and it is, in fact, the crux of mixing. Once we get the balances right, things like EQ and compression are actually just more nuanced ways of getting those balances to be correct. So the levels are actually really everything at the end of the day. So this is going to be one of those tutorials where I understand that maybe not as many people are going to watch it as I would prefer. I make a lot of tutorials that way because I make tutorials based on what I believe is going to teach you the best information, not necessarily based on what information people are out there looking for. So without further ado, let's pop into this. I'm going to play this record down. This record is uh, taken from the Pro Mix Academy. Thank you very much, Warren and Bob Horn, for getting these stems, putting them up. Uh, really wonderful stuff. So I'm going to play it down, and then I'm going to go through the process of how we should conceive levels, and then how we actually set them, and some of the considerations that occur while we're doing it. And you'll see that actually setting levels and finding the way to set the levels is really a lot more exciting than it sounds at first. All right, here we go. Hey boy, what you doing loving? This girl won't do the same. Her hands all over your body will go as quick as she can. Listen, what I'm looking for and never find wrapped up in your beautiful disguise. So what I just played back is called a faders up playback. It's just everything set at unison and then played through. So there's really no effects going on. There's nothing special happening. This is how it was recorded in. And we're in a great place. One thing that I think is really important in the record making process is that your faders up mix should sound good. Should it sound great or finished? Not necessarily, but the closer that we can get it, the better off we're going to be when it comes time to mix. So we're already in a really good place, which is going to make this a lot easier to go through. Now, when I hear the faders up mix, I have to make certain assessments. First of all, I want to understand what is the emotional intention of this record. And for me, this is a dance record. It is a feel-good record. It's something that should be exciting. So I'm thinking of words like groove, uh, happy, feels good, you know, uplifting, exciting. Those are the kinds of adjectives I'm stapling onto this record. So I know when I'm making my decisions that if I'm not sure what to do, I can go back to those ideas and say, what's going to make this feel the most uplifting? What's going to make this feel the most dancey? And that becomes my beacon for how to start framing things. All right, then I start asking the question right underneath that, which is what is really the spirit of this track? What is the backbone of this track? 
There are different ways to start a mix. Some people will start from the rhythm section. Some people will start from the vocals. Uh, very often, I will find whatever speaks to me and becomes the most inspiring. Maybe there's just one element in the mix that only happens one time, but to me, it's the coolest thing in the world. And I'll start there because it gives me the inspiration to get the ball rolling. Uh, but I think a really solid way to start a record is by identifying what the key element defining the record really is. In this particular case, I think that it's pretty clear. I think that the key element is the guitar. And the way that the guitar and the vocal, which is the other main element that will be grabbing our attention, the way those communicate, that is going to be the most essential balance. Once I've got that balance structured, once I've got that relationship right, I think everything else can fall into place. Now, how do we identify what is the key elements, right? The key elements to me are the ones where if you take them away, the song no longer exists. This one is really nice and easy to identify because we start with the guitar, and only the guitar, and then get the vocals. And from there, that gives us the song. It's really spelled out very cleanly in this particular case. Sometimes the focal elements change. Maybe it's the guitar in the verse, but then it becomes a piano in the chorus or something like that. That can happen as well. But typically, the main element, the focal element, is the one where if you strip everything else away and you have just that, and the vocals, you still have the song. All right, so I'm going to now pull all of the faders down here. I'm gonna zero out all these channels, or I'm gonna pull all of them down, not zero out, that's bad terminology. And now I'm going to set my guitars here up at Unity, and this is going to become the framework for me to work from. Great, so now, I'm going to go to my vocal and I'm going to get the balance between my vocals and my guitars all settled out. All right, let's start with the verse here. Let's pull this up to Unity as well. Boy, what you doing loving? This girl won't do the same. And I think in the verse, just the way the unity is set is a really good starting point. As I introduce more elements, I might fine tune these things a little bit more. But as just a general re relationship in the verse, I think I'm off to a really, really good start. This is working. We're good. Okay, now let's pop on over to the chorus. So the guitar changes in the chorus. It goes from a palm muted guitar to an open guitar. So one thing I might do right off the bat is just feel how the guitar moves going from the verse to the chorus. Because if I want this to feel really exciting, then having a big dynamic change might actually really help that along. There's, a, there's clearly an intended change here. There's a tone shift from this sort of darker, funkier, tighter guitar to this more open, bright one. So what if I just had these guitars come up ever so slightly in the chorus so that there's a little bit of explosiveness, something that really makes it pop? I like it. We're already off to a really good place. Just in that one little move, I'm already setting myself up for what's going to be impactful for the end listener. What's going to give them that, bam, here we are, we're in the chorus. Little bit of extra level on that guitar in the chorus. And now when I fit my vocal, I can start fitting it to that. So let's get the lead up. You've got the sweetness that I've been craving. I can't forget just how good it tasted. You got the spice ball. I think the level of this vocal is okay. Uh, there's a bunch of stacks, so I might start changing things around. But if it was just this vocal, I would probably want to push it up a little bit more, which makes sense because I pushed up the guitar a little bit, or just pushing up the top end of it to kind of compete with those guitars and match the energy of those guitars, that might work as well. But I'm just gonna do it with level for now and get these basic level ideas down. You got the sweetness that I've been craving. 
I like that a little bit better with that extra bit of lift in the vocal. Now we have a unison double of the vocal. So I'm going to pull this up to unity here and I'm gonna listen to it down and then I'm gonna make a really important decision. You've got the sweetness that I've been craving. I can't forget just how good it tasted. You've got the spice for the love. All right, so I really like how this vocalist is doubling himself. He's got, it's been really well edited and it's already tonally matching very well. I like the sound of this double a lot. When I have unison doubles, I have to make a level decision. Do I want this unison double to be just reinforcing and giving body to the main lead? In which case I would probably want to pull this down pretty significantly. You've got the sweetness that I've been craving. I can't forget just how good it's not one of those things where I'm hearing like, oh, it's doubled. It's more like I'm going to miss it when it's gone because it's just not going to have the presence in body. But in this particular case, I like hearing the two voices. I feel like they mesh really well. Once I've got the second voice in and it's kind of loud, I also feel like I can bring this, this main vocal line down a bit. And I think that that's going to give us a better balance. You've got the sweetness that I've been craving. I can't forget just how good it is. Tasted. I love that. I think that's great. So we're going to work from there. Now, uh, uh, right underneath that, we've got these harmony stacks. We've got choruses comped together from harmonies. I like that they're pre-comped. That really makes life a lot easier. That's wonderful. So let's pull in this first one right here and feel it out. You've got the sweetness that I've been craving. I can't forget just how good it tasted. you Get the spice for the love we're making. I want to know. Okay, I'm gonna be a little nitpicky here. I'm gonna say something that, that could be taken as a negative. It's not really intended to be, it just is what it is. This vocalist has not really been practiced with their falsetto to the extent in which they could be. The falsetto is kind of pinched in the upper palate and front of face, so it's going ah like that. Uh, kind of like a Bee Gees thing, but the shape of the the larynx and the the body of the breathing is not fully right. There's too much tension in the neck. There's too much forward palate, and so it's becoming a kind of brassy sound. Because of that, I don't think that the falsetto plays too nicely when it's really up. So I do want it to be present because I think it's going to need that lift for the brightening of the record and to give it that pop that they're looking for. I like the idea of it, and I think that the falsetto is okay. It's not throwing me off. Everything's really in tune. It's generally well performed, but there is a tonality issue that I think is going to throw this chorus off if it's too pronounced. So I'm going to pull this chorus down a little bit. Maybe it's 6 dB. Let's see how it feels there. You've got the sweetness that I've been craving. I can't forget just how good it tasted. So I think somewhere between unity and minus 6 dB is going to be about right for where that falsetto should sit. So this level decision is really a lot more than just a casual level decision. I think that it's an assessment of how well these things are gelling, how well they're relating, what it's going to do for the ear, and it's a really important decision to make because it's going to really change the affect of the chorus. So I'm going to push it up just a little bit, and I think that's going to be the right spot. You've got the sweetness that I've been craving. Perfect. Now we've got the lead unison vocal, which is fantastically performed, masking the slight tonal issues that could have maybe been a little bit better in the falsetto, and now we're just getting the good energy from the falsetto line. It's still there, it's still present, and it's still doing what it needs to do, so I think this is a good way to seat it. Now, let's bring in these next couple of doubles. I'm going to bring them in together because they kind of end up doing something similar. You've got the sweetness that I've been craving. Ah, I had actually done my own edits. Let me undo those edits real quick because it, this is going to be an important point in a moment. But let's hear this. You got the sweetness that I've been craving. I can't forget just how good it tasted. You got the spice for the love we're making. I want to know. So when I listen to this, those second sets of punches here, these harmonies, they give me great energy. You that I've been praying. 
Raven. There's a little gravel in the voice that I like. Uh, the falsettos that are being performed inside of these stacks, to me, are really well performed. They don't have any of that pinch, so it's sitting really nicely. I think that these should be pretty loud. Uh, however, there's something else to point out about this. There's a really smart part of the arrangement going into where these are showing up. It's forming a pattern. Music is all based on patterns. And giving people patterns, taking those patterns away, varying those patterns, changing the tension and release and the color of those patterns is all going to create the emotional structure, what people want to hear, what people feel like they need to hear. And so when we get these patterns going, they are very, very powerful tools. This is doing two wonderful things. First of all, it's breaking up the pattern of the lead, so it's waking us up, but it's also establishing its own pattern, so it creates this very comfortable fun space, and so I really, really, really like this harmony structure. However, I do want to point out that there is something going on in this structure that kind of takes away from the pattern that we establish. You got the sweetness that I've been craving. I really like that scale of it going, do, 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 right? I like that really simple structural pattern. I think it works very well. but. If you notice, in one of the takes, we have this extra note that shows up. That I be it sings the that. I don't think that we need that. I think that that disrupts the pattern. And once we've got this pattern established, when we go over to the second phrase, there's again an extra note in front, and I don't think we're going to need that either. So let's listen to it the way that it came in, and then I'm going to remove that note. And while this is subtle, I think it's important. You got the sweetness that I've been craving. I can't forget just how good it tasted. Now let's get rid of that first note and let's listen again. You got the sweetness that I've been craving. I can't forget just how good it tasted. You got the spice. So when we have that extra bit of space, to me, it makes the listener want to hear that scalar movement again, so when it comes back in, it's very satisfying. Now, you might disagree, and I'll tell you right now, this is where we're going to see some divergent ideas. There is a difference between being an engineer and being a producer, and the difference is in the degree of autonomy you take in which you're making decisions. If I'm the engineer and it's sent to me this way, I think this is a gray area. I tend to be a little bit more liberal with the decision-making process than I think many engineers. There isn't necessarily a right or wrong to that, it's just I know I'm going to piss off more clients than some other engineers might. But I would probably cut this even as an engineer. But as a producer, you have a lot of autonomy in the decision-making process. You decide what you want to hear. You are responsible for the product. That is the definition of a producer. So if I'm the producer here, I'm absolutely cutting that note. I'm taking that as my prerogative and I'm going for it. Now, once that note is cut, then it's just a question of finding that exact right level. And now, what do I want from this? I want it to surprise our listener. I want it to wake our listener up. I want it to give us something that's uplifting. At the same time, I don't want it to completely cover the lead line. I still want that lead line from the vocal to be followed. I still want that to be in the ear because this is the refrain. This is the part that people would sing back and I don't want to take too much away from that. You got the sweetness that I've been craving. I can't forget. So, the way it's sitting now, I think it's too, too loud. I think I just want it too loud. Like, I want it a little unbalanced in favor of these punches, but I just don't want it quite as unbalanced as it is. So, I'm going to knock it down like two and a half dB on each one of these, and let's feel it out. You got the sweetness that I've been craving. I can't forget just how good it tasted. Okay, I like it. I think we're in the right ballpark. We may reassess, but right now that's kind of working for me. Maybe it's a little on the safe side. Maybe I should just knock it up to like minus 2 dB. Like even these little half dB increments can sometimes make a difference. So I think I kind of want to err on the side of being a little surprising. You got the sweetness that I've been craving. I can't forget just It's a little negotiable. It could go either way. I think I'm going to set it safer for now. But we're definitely going to reassess that down the line as more things start showing up. Okay, so now I've, I've got pretty much my relationship. Let me jump to the pre-chorus here, make sure that I get that correct. What I'm looking for I never find Wrapped up in your beautiful disguise Honestly, I don't think I really mind. 
So I, this is interesting actually. We have two different performances that work very well. I think that they're supposed to be kind of even with each other. We have this higher one. What I'm looking for I never find. And we've got this lower one. What I'm looking for I never find. Wrapped up. And I think the intention is for the higher one to be the more dominant one, but I kind of like what the low one is doing. So it's going to really change the artist's picture of what they were envisioning, I think, but I'm getting that really good Bootsy Collins energy from that low one. So I think I'm going to set the low one as kind of my my dominant one. What I'm looking for I never find. And I'm going to bring in the high one so that it's almost as prominent, but not quite as strong. What I'm looking for I never find Wrapped up in your beautiful disguise Yeah, I like it that way. Now, again, this is one of those things. This is subjective. I'm deciding the relationship. You might listen to that and go, no, the high one is absolutely better. I like that sort of, like, kind of greasy slickness to the low one. That speaks to me. But it might not speak to you, and that's okay. Now, let's pop on in to the bass. Let's figure out the funk of it. I'm, you got the sweetness that I've been craving. I can't forget just how good it tasted. You so this is supposed to be a dancey record. So I would say there's a lot of movement here in this bass. This bass to me should be up. It should be prominent because it is really pushing that groove. And I, I would say that anything less than loud on the bass is not going to work. You got the sweetness that I've been craving. I can't forget just how good it tasted. You got the spice. Even if it starts like masking the kick drum down the line or whatever, there's a lot of movement in this bass. It's really holding down that pocket. Now, what's interesting is, is that we're getting a lot of movement from the guitar as well. So let's pull up an alternate. We have these additional bass fills that do this. You got the sweetness that I've been craving. I can't forget just how good it tasted. You got the spice for the love me. And I think that there might be some merit to playing with how important these supplementary bases actually are in the mix. I think it's going to be... I think it could go either way. So I'm going to keep these muted for now, since I'm at a point of indecision, and instead I'm going to move over to the drums, and I'm going to see what the drums are doing. Okay, we have a lot going on with the drums here. We have live drums that are sample augmented, and then we have two loops of drums going on. So I'm going to pull them all up. Let's get them all up to Unity, and let's play them through. Nice. I don't think I really mind I just want to taste you one more time You got the sweetness that I've been craving I can't forget just how good it tasted So now what I'm going to do is kind of comb through all this stuff I'm going to mute these loops and just listen to the live drums Basically I want to figure out how much do I want to lean on the loops how much do I want to leave on the lean on the live drums? How blended should they be? Et cetera, et cetera. You got the sweetness that I've been craving. I can't forget just how good. I'm going to mute the samples too for a second, actually. Let's take those out. Let's just hear the actual, let's just hear the actual drums. You got the sweetness that I've been craving. I can't forget just how good it tasted You got the spice for the love we're making I want another chance to taste it Okay, I'm gonna file that into into my my mind here because it sounds good It sounds like a just a good capture of drums and while there's nothing wrong with that I wonder if there's enough flavor to it. I feel like I would have to be a little transformative with my processing to use these drums and get them to work right because they're just a little bit too 
just basically like if someone was like, give me a good drum sound. Here we are. Let's pull up the loop and see what that's all about. You got the sweetness that I've been craving. I can't forget just how good it tasted. You got the spice. So like for example, when I pull up the loop, the loop is definitely not as perfect as the live drums in a lot of way. Like the snare is leaning very far to the right and the kick definitely doesn't have as much weight on the bottom, but it also has a lot of personality and I really like the sound of it. It reminds me very much of like those New Jack swing sort of drums in terms of just how it is. Uh, and then there's also this second loop here. And so let's push that up a little bit and listen to it. You got the sweetness that I've been craving. I can't forget just how good it tasted. You got the spice for the love we're making. Also has that like really early 90s sound, like it's a little bit like metal-ish. Like not metal like the genre, but like metallic sounding. It it's, reminds me of that like very late 80s, early 90s kind of uh, pop drum type thing and it has a lot of personality as well notice that even though the like the timing of all the hits is the same the actual feel of the swing is tremendously different between these two loops you got the sweetness that i've been craving i can't forget you got the sweetness that i've been craving i can't forget just how good it tasted it's like one feels a lot more upfront than the other. Like it, it feels more metric to the grid, even though I feel like the drums are kind of like the snare is landing in the same spot. And I think that if I zoom in, it will, yeah, it like perfectly lines up, but there's still a different feel to the swing of it because of the dynamics. I really like this funk loop. Let's go back to the live drums real quick. You got the sweetness that I've been craving. I can't forget just how good it tasted. Okay, I'm going to be honest. I feel like I could work with any of these and get something great. The question is just what? Do I want all of them? Do I want one of them? I'm kind of of the mindset that I would rather pick one as a dominant one and give that the personality of, make that the personality of the record than to get some kind of a blend to make it everything. Uh, again, this is a subjective choice. This is not a right or wrong. This is, this is how I think, and this is how I like to do it, but you might hear this stuff and be like, no, I would absolutely do it as a blend or something like that. And you might certainly pick a different one. I, my ear keeps telling me that this funk loop is really where it's at. You got the sweetness that I've been craving. I can't forget just how good it tasted. So I'm going to make that my main drum idea. And then all my other levels are going to be relative to this. So now what I'm wondering is if I bring in the overheads from the live drum recording, how does that sound with the funk loop? You got the sweetness that I've been craving. I can't forget just how good it tasted. You got the spice bottle. It works, but I wonder if it's really even entirely necessary. So here's another one of those places where there's a big difference between engineer and producer. As engineer, I'm going to make all of this stuff fit together, and I'm going to create something where it's it's clear this is being presented as the intention, so therefore I am going to make it work. As a producer, I don't know that I need the live drums. So I think I'm going to keep them muted, and I think I might pull out maybe some of the snare samples or kick samples to kind of reinforce this funk loop, but I'm not convinced that I actually need the live drums. Um, let's pull in this remix loop here and see what that feels like. You got the sweetness that I've been craving. I can't forget just how good it tasted. I like it as a textural element. I like that it makes the sound a little bit more complicated. So I, I feel like the two loops work together okay. Uh, I would probably need to EQ this one a little bit, this remix beat loop, because really what I want out of it is the textures. But I think that 6 dB down from the funk loop, it kind of works. Uh, the question is, do I need any of these samples that have been bust in? So let's, let's listen with the kick sample. You got the sweetness that I've been craving. I can't forget. 
Let's also check the phase, make sure we're getting the most out of it. You got this. You got this. You got this. You got this. Sounds about the same. I think it sounded a little bit stronger when the face was flipped. You got the sweetness that I've been craving. I can't forget just how you. But I'm wondering if maybe it's not better just to simply like grab an EQ and kind of isolate the low end of this funk loop. And if I want more kick, just turn up the kick with an EQ. You I mean, remember I was saying EQ is basically fine tuning the level balances. It's a more nuanced way of doing it. Though well, this is an example of that. If I want a little bit more kick out of this funk loop, I could just use an EQ to do it. You got the sweetness that I've been craving. I can't forget just how you and I like that more than floating in a sample. I think that having the sample on hand and ready to go is really convenient and nice, but I just don't feel like I need it. Uh, let's pull in these snare samples. You got the sweetness that I've been craving. I can't forget just how you... Okay, one thing right off the bat is that because this funk loop has the snare leaning off to the right... This snare sample immediately feels weird when it's panned in the center. So I'm going to match it like 50% right, and that's how I'm going to know whether or not the snare sample is helping, or if it's hurting, or what. You got the sweetness that I've been craving. I can't forget just how good it tasted. Okay, I dig it. Let's check snare sample two. You got the sweetness that I've been craving. Snare sample 2 is a little tighter than snare sample 1. It, it's also not quite as like, it's not giving me as much of that New Jack Swing sort of vibe. And I think I might want to keep some of that New Jack Swing sort of vibe just because it feels like it's very deliberate that this record is calling on that. Yeah, so I'll probably end up using that snare sample 1. The other thing I want to check is this clap. I kind of want to try it where the clap is panned to the same place as the snare. You got the sweetness that I've been craving. I can't forget just how good it tasted. You got the spice for the love. I really like that, actually. It makes me feel like I don't need the other samples as much either. Like, it just fits on top in a really nice way. So I'm just going to keep it here, and I think that this is going to be my drum blend. So I, I know it's a little crazy because it's like I've left all of these tracks muted. Like, what am I even thinking? But it's, you know, a lot of the times you get good ideas in the studio, but because of the way that you intended to make something, maybe you you can't see the forest from within the trees, maybe I'm just wrong, and this is not really what the artist would ever want, but this is the way that I'm hearing it. I don't think we need all of these extra tracks. So I'm gonna keep it like this, and then as I continue building, you know, like I said, I keep saying, as I keep building, we reassess. Let's go back to the bass. You got the sweetness that I've been praying. Forget just how good it tasted. You got the spice ball. You know, now that the drums are in, I kind of feel like the bass is giving me a little bit more movement than I need. Because the guitars already have a fair amount of movement in them, and the drums also have a fair amount of movement in them. So maybe this main bass. Let's try these supplementary basses and see how that feels. You got the sweetness that I've been craving. I love that. I think that that's awesome. I like that there's that big space and that it allows for everything to move inside and then it pulls us back to that one, gives us that heavy downbeat. I like the texture and tone of it. Uh, it reminds me of that like uh, Bad Mama Jamma synth bass thing. Uh, I'm really excited about it, and also the texture of it kind of makes that industrial remix beat loop, that other drum loop, kind of make a little bit more sense why it's there, because they get along here. So I would say that for this chorus, I'm going to be honest, I, here I go again, I don't think that I need this main bass line, really. I think I can get without it. 
Now, before that, obviously there's no base printed here. I'm, this is probably good to have here leading in. Obviously, I don't think I really mind. I just want to taste you one more time. Yeah, because also listen to how the bass is speaking to the vocal line. Those two feel like they're in complete agreement. So I want that bass and that vocal to be basically the same level because they're telling me the same story and I like it. But when I get to the chorus, that's not the case. I'm getting I'm getting a much different story and actually in a lot of ways having these big industrial spread out basses that's almost doing more what those vocal stacks were doing. And so it's telling that story and I like that story quite a bit. I don't think I really mind I just want to taste you one more time You got the sweetness that I've been craving I can't forget just how good it tasted You got the I like the level too. I like the bass being almost obscenely loud. Like, I think that that really works for what's going on here, and I love that transition between that pre-chorus and this chorus. This is maybe a tutorial on how to get fired by your client, <laughs> but bear with me here because I, I want... I think it's more important to be able to make strong decisions with vision. Well, that has like a little rhyme to it. Decisions with vision. That's the... Maybe that's the name of this tutorial. I don't know, but... I think it's important to have the capability to see a vision for a record and make something with strong decisions that is going to possibly polarize people. Because the one thing you don't want to do is be average. No one cares about something that's good. At all. You want something that people are either going to hear as terrible or amazing. And it's very, very typical that things that people hear as amazing are the exact same things that other people hear as terrible. You don't want to be in the middle ground because then no one cares. No one's interested in a B plus, right? So we're going for failures or we're going for A plus with extra credit and nothing in between. That's my philosophy on it. All right, so anyway, that ran over. Let's jump back to getting these levels right. You know what's interesting? In this little pre-section here, we've got just the clap. I wonder if that's gonna sound okay on the side. What I'm looking for and never find. Let's play leading into it. We'll go as quick as she can. Listen. What I'm looking for and never find Wrapped up in your beautiful disguise Okay, so this is a little atypical, but actually I like the clap pan to the right. I think, I think it works. Um, it's not... My brain tells me that's not where it should be. But my gut feeling says this is exciting. It's lifted up the space, it's opened things up a bit, and in an unpredictable way. It's also created an unbalanced image, uh, but there's a lot of space in this segment. Like, I don't think that there's too many other things that really come in here. We have this, like, really cool guitar fill that kind of leads us in. Listen. But, uh, that should definitely be really loud. One-time events, usually I err on the side of louder because they kind of wake us up. As quick as she can. Listen. But, um, the Even a little louder than that, but you see where I'm going with it. As quick as she can. Yeah, and then we, we have like, we have the synth fill. I think maybe the sub bass comes in here. Yeah, and we have the sub bass, so let's try that. Okay, that's a little too loud. We can, we can chill out on that. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so somewhere in there, like still loud, but not like, oh my god. Looking for and never find Wrapped up in your beautiful disguise Obviously, I don't think so Yeah, so we have a lot of space to play with. I would even consider doing something like creating my own little unique effect, like maybe um, doing like, like a, a clap have the clap on one side, but then have it do like a like a delayish reverb kind of thing on the other side, like a like sort of a fake stereo kind of thing. Um, 
have a preset off of the crystalline here. So I'm going to make a reverb and uh, go into my user preset here. This is a cool little thing, and I'm going to pan the reverb to the other side. So the reverb is going to end up on our left. Yeah, like that. Go a little further, even to the left, actually, a slightly wider image. That's exciting. I like that. It's quirky, it's weird, but it creates a cool rhythmic effect. I really, really like that. And this idea is coming from the levels and, and well, I guess the pan position as well, but this is, this is why following the chain of thought with getting the levels right starts to create the emotional connection of the mix. It starts to show what the personality of the record is going to be. So as we're building up these levels and determining the relationship between all these different elements, that's when the creativity starts to build up and flow. It's not like I'm grabbing an idea out of left field, out of nowhere, like I listen to it faders up. I, I, that thought did not exist when I played the Faders Up mix. It was not even within the realm of anything. It's not until I started building the levels and internalizing the record and feeling the, the, the emotion of it, like it's supposed to be fun, it's supposed to be groovy. Hey, this is giving me something that's fun, groovy, it opens up this section, gives it that lift, that excitement. This is playing right into the emotion of the record. So let's, let's play it through uh, following up into the chorus section. Let's get this crash cymbal and then maybe start working in some of the padding synths real quick. Uh, let's just throw up the crash to Unity and see if that feels right. Time. You've got the sweetness that I've been craving. I can't forget. Yeah, I'd say that's about right. The crash is a little bit, like, it's got a little bit too much heaviness to it, I think. I'll probably end up EQing out some of the bottom end of the crash just to make it feel a little lighter. But I think level-wise, that's about the right area. Takes you in my time. Yeah, probably. And now at this point, this might also be where in my own process I would start doing things like, you know, pulling up EQs just to kind of like help. And notice this, I'm just grabbing a one band EQ right here, by the way. I'm not like, this is not going to be anything crazy. I'm just going to literally take out bass from this crash cymbal, right? So, you know, we're not getting wild yet. Things will start to build as they go. But now I feel like this is going to translate better. Taste you in my time. You got the sweetness that I've been craving. I can't forget just how good. Yeah, that felt way better to me. A lot lighter. And, and the emotion of this song is supposed to have a lightness to it, a danciness to it. So I don't want this heavy crash weighing down the downbeat of the chorus. I want it to be light, like, ha, ah, kind of like a, like a brightening kind of a thing. So let's grab these synths. Let's see what these synths are about. Okay, we've got uh, we've got some pad synths. We've got what looks like a synth that's probably playing something really similar to those vocal stacks. I think I want to get the pad in first. Okay, cool little '80s pad synth thing. It's a little thin sounding. Pads are really unique. A lot of the times, if you get a pad and it was just this one pad and we didn't have a second pad to layer underneath it or something like that, a lot of the times I'll sneak my own pad layer in just because I find that with, with thin pads in particular, there's no way to get a good level for them. They're either low enough where they're not getting in the way of anything, but then they're barely there. You've got the sweetness that I've been praying. I can't forget just how like that's not really doing anything, or it's loud enough where we can really hear it, but then it's kind of covering everything up. Yeah, 
I don't really like that either because it's masking all of the groove elements, so it's taking away from the groove, and that is not the emotion of this record. If this the record was supposed to be something that was more ambient or dark or solemn or sad, or you know, having a heavy pad in there that kind of drones will give it that that feeling of the doldrums, you know. But that's not what this record is attempting to be. So as soon as we have a pad layer it thickens up the pad sound and we can get it to a more manageable level where it can be lower and not masking any of the groove elements, but still present enough where it feels like we're filling up the soundscape. Especially when we have clean pads like this. Those are a nightmare to balance because it, it gives us one frequency, like it's basically a sine wave, and so it's either like way up or it's way down, and you can never find a middle ground. So I would say I'm gonna get this this very like sinusoidal sound where it's just loud enough where I can hear it, and then that's gonna provide the support for the bolder, more textured pad. Yeah, so about 6 dB down, and you can hear that it's not really doing the job it needs to do on its own. But now when I bring in this pad synth, even if I knock this pad synth down like, you know, 6 dB on its own, it's going to fill up that space pretty quick. In fact, I feel like I can even pull this layered pad down just another hair, and that'll probably do it. Right on. And then I'm already thinking like, hey, these pad synths, they're not really quintessential to the music bed. The record still exists without them. I can use these for space. I can use these to create a symmetrical stereo widening effect and like really use something like a like a mid-side imager of some sort to stretch the sides out a lot. And if it doesn't fold to mono perfectly, I don't care. It's not quintessential to what needs to be heard when the record folds to mono. So I can use this to my advantage and create a really wide side-to-side -side image for this chorus with these backup pads. So again, I'm formulating my ideas as I'm getting these levels together. Uh, let's pull up the gated synth. We'll get, I'm going to get the rest of the synths in, and then I think I'm going to wrap it there, because I think that this is uh, pretty much the ideas that I needed to communicate. Yeah, it's kind of giving me the same energy that those vocal stacks are giving me. Bump, bump, bump. Bump, bump, bump. Kind of the same vibe, so I, I want these to be on the louder side, I just don't want them to cover anything important up. I think it might be just a hair too loud, but maybe not too, too loud. You are my time. You got the sweetness that I've been craving. I can't forget just how I like that. Cool. And then let's pull up the ref synth. And hopefully this kind of meshes with what the bass is doing. Like if we hear what the bass does right in this like little gap space. It's got that ba boom boom. If that ref synth really matches that, it's going to work really well. Yeah, similar idea, right? so satisfying when, when we're relying on that that other bass and then we hear this ref synth with it, with, with it which is forming a nice little stack on top oh it's so satisfying to hear it feels it's it feels so gratifying and i think that that's going to really really work with the end listener so i I hope this, could, let's just take a second to go back over how much processing we've actually done so far. Pretty much none, except for what, taking lows out of the crash, adding kick, a little low to the kick, and then this this weird quirky reverb effect that frankly could have been a production effect and sent to me. You know what I mean? Like I'm kind of thinking of it that way. There's no EQs, there's no compression, there's no nothing, but 
let's listen to it one more time down with just the elements we've brought in and feel it out, and then we'll wrap the tutorial there. And I think that that's going to really show what I'm getting at here. Hey boy, what you doing loving? This girl won't do the same. Her hands all over your body will go as quick as she can. Listen. What I'm looking for and never find Wrapped up in your beautiful disguise So now we have something where not only am I working out the levels and working toward a great mix here, but the idea of the mix is becoming very clear and it's becoming closer and closer into full picture focus, right? It's like it started as this kind of blurry idea where it's like you can tell what the image is, but as we start getting the levels, suddenly the, the image becomes sharper and sharper and the vision becomes more clear. And so as I keep building these levels with all the peripheral elements, then it's going to lead me to be like, okay, now I know exactly how to sharpen things with my EQ, exactly how to sharpen things with compression, delays, reverb, saturation, etc because I know what the record wants to be. So this, I say all of this to say this. The mix of the record doesn't happen here. It's not this stuff, right? It's not this. The mix happens here. It happens here. It happens with what you feel out and the emotion of it, and you establish that by getting the balances and the connections between the elements. How is the music talking to itself. Music is a conversation of different instruments. How are they communicating? What is that communication feeling like? What do I want it to feel like? And once we figure that out, once we create that, that puts us on the path to something that is great. All right, guys, thanks for checking in. Hope you got a lot out of this video. And you know what we say at WeissAdvice.com. We are musicians. Sound is our instrument. And I will catch you next time.